Chapter Twenty One of The Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Red and the Black, Volume One by Stendhal, translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter Twenty One: Dialogue with a Master. Alas, our frailty is the cause, not we. For such as we are made of, such we be. Twelfth Night. It was with a childish pleasure that for a whole hour Julian put the words together. As he came out of his room, he met his pupils with their mother. She took the letter with a simplicity and a courage whose calmness terrified him. Is the math glue dry enough yet? she asked him. And is this the woman who was so maddened by remorse, he thought? What are her plans at this moment? He was too proud to ask her, but she had never perhaps pleased him more. If this turns out badly, she added with the same coolness, I shall be deprived of everything. Take charge of this, and bury it in some place of the mountain. It will perhaps one day be my only resource. She gave him a glass case in red morocco filled with gold and some diamonds. Now go, she said to him. She kissed the children, embracing the youngest twice. Julian remained motionless. She left him at a rapid pace without looking at him. From the moment that Monsieur de Renal had opened the anonymous letter, his life had been awful. He had not been so agitated since the duel which he had just missed having in 1816, and to do him justice, the prospect of receiving a bullet would have made him less unhappy. He scrutinized the letter from every standpoint. Is that not a woman's handwriting? he said to himself. In that case, what woman had written it? He reviewed all those whom he knew at Verrier without being able to fix his suspicions on any one. Could a man have dictated this letter? Who was that man? Equal uncertainty at this point. The majority of his acquaintances were jealous of him, and no doubt hated him. I must consult my wife, he said to himself through habit, as he got up from the armchair in which he had collapsed. Great God, he said aloud before he got up, striking his head. It is she above all whom I must be distrustful. At the present moment, she is my enemy, and tears came into his eyes through sheer anger. By a poetic justice of that hardness of heart which constitutes the provincial idea of shrewdness, the two men whom Monsieur de Renal feared the most at the present moment were his two most intimate friends. I have ten friends perhaps after those, and he passed them in review, gauging the degree of consolation which he could get from each one. All of them, he exclaimed in a rage, will derive the most supreme pleasure from my awful experience. As luck would have it, he thought himself envied, and not without reason. Apart from his superb town mansion in which the king had recently spent the night, and thus conferred on it an enduring honor, he had decorated his chateau at Verger extremely well. The façade was painted white and the windows adorned with fine green shutters. He was consoled for a moment by the thought of this magnificence. The fact was that this chateau was seen from three or four leagues off, to the great prejudice of all the country houses or so-called chateau of the neighborhood, which had been left in the humble gray color given them by time. There was one of his friends, on whose pity and whose tears Monsieur de Renal could count, the church warden of the parish, but he was an idiot who cried at everything. This man, however, was his only resource. What unhappiness is comparable to mine, he exclaimed with rage, what isolation. Is it possible, said this truly pitiable man to himself, is it possible that I have no friend in my misfortune of whom I can ask advice? For my mind is wandering, I feel it. Oh, Falco, oh, Ducrow, he exclaimed with bitterness, those were the names of two friends of his childhood whom he had dropped owing to his snobbery of 1814. They were not noble, and he had wished to change the footing of equality on which he had been living with them since their childhood. One of them, Falco, a paper merchant of Verrier and a man of intellect and spirit, had bought a printing press in the chief town of the department and undertaken the production of a journal. The priestly congregation had resolved to ruin him. His journal had been condemned, and he had been deprived of his printer's diploma. In these sad circumstances, he ventured to write to Monsieur de Renal for the first time for ten years. The mayor of Verrieres thought it his duty to answer in the old Roman style. If the king's minister were to do me the honor of consulting me, I should say to him, ruin ruthlessly all the provincial printers and make printing a monopoly like tobacco. 
Monsieur de Renal was horrified to remember the terms of this letter to an intimate friend whom all Verrieres had once admired. Who would have said that I, with my rank, my fortune, my decorations, would ever come to regret it? It was in these transports of rage directed now against himself, now against all his surroundings, that he passed an awful night. But fortunately, it never occurred to him to spy on his wife. I am accustomed to Louise, he said to himself. She knows all my affairs. If I were free to marry tomorrow, I should not find anyone to take her place. Then he began to plume himself on the idea that his wife was innocent. This point of view did not require any manifestations of character and suited him much better. How many calumniated women has one not seen? But, he suddenly exclaimed as he walked about feverishly, shall I put up with her making a fool of me with her lover as though I were a man of no account, some mere ragamuffin? Is all Verrier to make merry over my compliance? What have they not said about Charmier? He was a husband in the district who was notoriously deceived. Was there not even a smile on every lip at the mention of his name? He is a good advocate, but whoever said anything about his talent for speaking? Oh, Charmier, they say, Bernard Charmier, he is thus designated by the name of the man who disgraces him. I have no daughter, thank heaven, Monsieur de Renal would say at other times, and the way in which I am going to punish the mother will consequently not be so harmful to my children's household. I could surprise this little peasant with my wife and kill them both. In that case, the tragedy of the situation would perhaps do away with the grotesque element. This idea appealed to him. He followed it up in all its details. The penal code is on my side, and whatever happens, our congregation and my friends on the jury will save me. He examined his hunting knife, which was quite sharp, but the idea of blood frightened him. I could thrash this insolent tutor within an inch of his life and hound him out of the house. But what a sensation that would make in Verrieres, even the whole department. After Falco's journal had been condemned, and when its chief editor left prison, I had a hand in making him lose his place of six hundred francs a year. They say that this scribbler has dared to show himself again in Besancon. He may lampoon me adroitly and in such a way that it will be impossible to bring him up before the courts. Bring him up before the courts, the insolent wretch will insinuate in a thousand and one ways that he has spoken the truth. A well-born man who keeps his place like I do is hated by all the plebeians. I shall see my name in all those awful Paris papers. Oh, my God, what depths! To see the ancient name of Renal plunged in the mire of ridicule? If I ever travel, I shall have to change my name. What? Abandon that name which is my glory and my strength? Could anything be worse than that? If I do not kill my wife but turn her out in disgrace, she has her aunt in Besancon, who is going to hand all her fortune over to her. My wife will go and live in Paris with Julian. It will be known at Verrieres, and I shall be taken for a dupe. The unhappy man then noticed from the paleness of the lamplight that the dawn was beginning to appear. He went to get a little fresh air in the garden. At this moment, he had almost determined to make no scandal, particularly in view of the fact that a scandal would overwhelm with joy all his good friends in Verrieres. The promenade in the garden calmed him a little. No, he exclaimed, I shall not deprive myself of my wife. She is too useful to me. He imagined with horror what his house would be without his wife. The only relative he had was the Marquis of Ur, old, stupid, and malicious. A very sensible idea occurred to him, but its execution required a strength of character considerably superior to the small amount of character with the, which the poor man possessed. If I keep my wife, he said to himself, I know what I shall do one day. On some occasion, when she makes me lose patience, I shall reproach her with guilt. She is proud, we will quarrel, and all this will happen before she has inherited her aunt's fortune. How they will all make fun of me then! My wife loves her children. The results will be that everything will go to them. But, as for me, I shall be the laughing stock of Verrier. What, they will say, he could not even manage to revenge himself to his wife? Would it not be better to leave and verify nothing? In that case I tie my hands and cannot afterwards reproach her with anything. An instant afterwards, Monsieur de Renal once more 
a prey to a wounded vanity, set himself laboriously to recollect all the methods of procedure mentioned in the billiard room of the casino or the nobles' club in Verrier, when some fine talker interrupted the pool to divert himself at the expense of some deceived husband. How cruel these pleasantries appeared to him at the present moment! My God, why is my wife not dead? Then I should be impregnable against this ridicule. Why am I not a widower? I should go and pass six months in Paris in the best society. After this moment of happiness occasioned by the idea of widowerhood, his imagination reverted to the means of assuring himself of the truth. Should he put a slight layer of bran before the door of Julian's room at midnight after everyone had gone to bed? He would see the impression of the feet in the following morning. But no, that's no good, he suddenly exclaimed with rage. That inquisitive Elisa will notice it, and they will soon know all over the house that I am jealous. In another casino tale, a husband had assured himself of his misfortune by tying a hair with a little wax so that it shut the door of the gallant as effectually as a seal. After so many hours of this uncertainty, this means of clearing up his fate seemed to him emphatically the best, and he was thinking of availing himself of it when, in one of the turnings of the avenue, he met the very woman whom he would like to have seen dead. She was coming back from the village. She had gone to hear mass in the church of Verger, a tradition extremely doubtful in the eyes of the cold philosopher, but in which she believed, alleges that the little church was once the chapel of the chateau of the lord of Verger. This idea obsessed Madame de Renault all the time in the church that she had counted on sending in prayer. She kept on imagining herself the spectacle of her husband killing Julian when out hunting as though by accident and then making her eat his heart in the evening. My fate, she said to herself, depends on what he will think when he listens to me. It may be I shall never get another opportunity of speaking to him after this fatal quarter of an hour. He is not a reasonable person who is governed by his intellect. In that case, with the help of my weak intelligence, I could anticipate what he will do or say. He will decide our common fate. He has the power. But this fate depends on my adroitness, on my skill in directing the ideas of this crank, who is blinded by his rage and unable to see half of what takes place. Great God, I need talent and coolness. Where shall I get it? She regained her calmness as though by magic, and she entered the garden and saw her husband in the distance. His disheveled hair and disordered dress showed that he had not slept. She gave him a letter with a broken seal, but folded. As for him, without opening it, he gazed at his wife with the eyes of a madman. "'Here's an abominable thing,' she said to him, "'which an evil-looking man who makes out that he knows you and is under an obligation to you handed to me as I was passing behind the notary's garden. I insist on one thing, and that is that you send back this Monsieur Julien to his parents and without delay.' Madame de Renal hastened to say these words, perhaps a little before the psychological moment, in order to free herself from the awful prospect of having to say them. She was seized with joy on seeing that which she was occasioned to her husband. She realized from the fixed state which he was riveting on her that Julian had surmised rightly. What a genius he is to be so brilliantly diplomatic instead of succumbing to so real a misfortune, she thought. He will go very far in the future. Alas, his successes will only make him forget me. This little act of admiration for the man whom she adored quite cured her of her trouble. She congratulated herself on her tactics. I have not been unworthy of Julian, she said to herself in a sweet and secret pleasure. Monsieur de Renal kept examining the second anonymous letter, which the reader may remember was composed of printed words glued on to a paper verging on blue. He did not say a word for fear of giving her himself away. They still make fun of me in every possible way, said Monsieur de Renal to himself, overwhelmed with exhaustion. Still, more new insults to examine, and all the time on account of my wife. He was on the point of heaping on her the coarsest insults. He was barely checked by the prospects of the Bessoncon legacy. Consumed by the need of venting his feelings on something, he crumpled up the paper of the second anonymous letter and began to walk about with huge strides. He needed to get away from his wife. A few moments afterwards he came back to her in a quieter frame of mind. "'The thing is to take some definite line and send Julian away,' she said immediately. 
after all it is only a labourer's son you will compensate him a few crowns and besides he is clever and will manage to find a place with monsieur valenod for example or with the sub-prefect de morion who both have children in that way you will not be doing him any wrong there you go talking like a fool that you are exclaimed monsieur de renal in a terrible voice how can one hope that a woman will show any good sense you never bother yourself about common sense how can you ever get to know anything your indifference and your idleness give you no energy except for hunting those miserable butterflies which we are unfortunate to have in our houses madame de renal let him speak and he spoke for a long time he was working off his anger to use the local expression monsieur she answered him at last i speak as a woman who has been outraged in her honour that is to say in what she holds most precious madame de renal preserved an unalterable sang-froid during all this painful conversation on the result of which depended the possibility of still living under the same roof as julian she sought for the ideas which she thought most adapted to guide her husband's blind anger into a safe channel she had been insensible to all the insulting imputations which he had addressed to her she was not listening to them she was then thinking about julian will he be pleased with me this little peasant whom we have loaded with attentions and even with presents may be innocent she said to him at last but he is none the less the occasion for the first affront that i have ever received monsieur when i read this abominable paper i vowed to myself that either he or i should leave your house do you want to make a scandal so as to dishonour me and yourself as well will you make things hum in verrieres i can assure you it is true the degree of prosperity in which your prudent management has succeeded in placing you yourself your family and the town is the subject of general envy well i will assure julian to ask you for a holiday and go and spend the month with that wood merchant of the mountains a fit friend to be sure for the list little labourer mind you do nothing at all resumed monsieur de renal with a fair amount of tranquillity i particularly insist on your not speaking to him you will put him into a temper and make him quarrel with me you know to what extent this little gentleman is always spoiling for a quarrel that young man has no tact resumed madame de renal he may be learned you know all about that but at the bottom he is only a peasant for my own part i never thought much of him since he refused to marry eliza it was an assured fortune and that on the pretext that she made secret visits to monsieur valenod ah said monsieur de renal lifting up his eyebrows inordinately what did julian tell you that not exactly you always talked of the vocation which calls him to the holy ministry but believe me the first vocation for these lower class people is getting their bread and butter he gave me to understand that he was quite aware of her secret visits and i i was ignorant exclaimed monsieur de renal growing as angry as before and accentuating his words things take place in my house which i know nothing about what has there been anything except eliza and valenod oh that's old history my dear said madame de renal with a smile and perhaps no harm has come of it it was at the time when your good friend valenod would not have minded their thinking at verrieres that a perfectly platonic little affection was growing up between him and me i had that idea once myself exclaimed monsieur de renal furiously striking his head as he progressed from discovery to discovery and you told me nothing about it should one set two friends by the ears on account of a little fit of vanity on the part of our dear director what society woman has not had addressed to her a few letters which are both extremely witty and even a little gallant he has written to you he writes a great deal show me those letters at once i order you said monsieur de renal pulling himself up to his six feet i will do nothing of the kind he was answered with a sweet verging on indifference i will show you them one day when you are in a better frame of mind this very instant odds life exclaimed monsieur de renal transported with rage and yet happier than he had been for twelve hours will you swear to me said madame de renal quite gravely never to quarrel with the director of the workhouse about these letters quarrel or no quarrel i can take those foundlings away from him but he continued furiously i want those letters at once where are they in a drawer in my secretary but i shall certainly not give you the key 
I'll manage to break it, he cried, running towards the wife's room. He did break, in fact, with a bar of iron a costly secretary of vain mahogany, which came from Paris, and which he had often been assumed to wipe with a nap of his coat when he thought he detected a spot. Madame de Renal had climbed up at a run the hundred and twenty steps of the dovecot. She tied the corner of a white handkerchief to one of the bars of iron of the little window. She was the happiest of women. With tears in her eyes, she looked towards the great mountain forest. Doubtless, she said to herself, Julian is watching for this happy signal. She listened attentively for a long while, and then she cursed the monotonous noise of the grasshopper and the song of the birds. Had it not been for that importunate noise, a cry of joy starting from the big rocks could have arrived here. Her greedy eye devoured that immense slope of dark verdure, which was as level as a meadow. Why isn't he clever enough, she said to himself, quite overcome, to invent some signal to tell me that his happiness is equal to mine? She only came down from the dovecot when she was frightened of her husband coming back there to look for her. She found him furious. He was perusing the soothing phrases of Monsieur de Valenod and reading them with an emotion to which they were but little used. I always come back to the same idea, said Madame de Renal, seizing a moment when a pause in her husband's ejaculations gave her the possibility of getting heard. It is necessary for Julian to travel. Whatever talent he may have for Latin, he is only a peasant after all, often coarse and lacking in tact. Thinking to be polite, he addresses inflated compliments to me every day, which are in bad taste. He learns them by heart out of some novel or other. He never reads one, exclaimed Monsieur de Renal. I am assured of it. Do you think that I am the master of a house who is so blind as to be ignorant of what takes place in his own home? Well, if he doesn't read these droll compliments anywhere, he invents them, and that's the worst so far as he is concerned. He must have talked about me in this tone in very air, and perhaps without going so far, said Madame de Renal with the idea of making a discovery. He may have talked in the same strain to Eliza, which is almost the same as if he had said it to Monsieur Valenod. Ah, exclaimed Monsieur de Renal, shaking the table in the room with one of the most violent raps ever made by a human fist. The anonymous printed letter in Valenod's letters are written on the same paper. At last, thought Madame de Renal, she pretended to be overwhelmed by this discovery, and without having the courage to add a single word, went and sat down some way off on the divan at the top of the drawing-room. From this point the battle was won. She had a great deal of trouble in preventing Monsieur de Renal from speaking to the supposed author of the anonymous letter. What, can't you see that making a scene with Monsieur Valenod without sufficient proof would be the most signal mistake? You are envied, Monsieur. And who is responsible? Your talents, your wise management, your tasteful buildings, the dowry which I have brought you, and above all the substantial legacy which we are entitled to hope for from my good aunt, a legacy the importance of which is inordinately exaggerated, have made you into the first person in Verrières. You are forgetting my birth, said Monsieur de Renal, smiling a little. You are one of the most distinguished gentlemen in the province, replied Madame de Renal emphatically. If the king were free and could give birth his proper due, you would no doubt figure in the chamber of peers, etc. And, being in the magnificent position, you yet wish to give the envious a fact to take hold of. To speak about this anonymous letter to Monsieur Valenod is equivalent to proclaiming over the whole of Verrières, nay, over the whole of Besancon, over the whole province that this little bourgeois who has been admitted perhaps imprudently to intimacy with a renal has managed to offend him at the time when those letters which you have just taken prove that i have reciprocated monsieur valenod's love you ought to kill me i should have deserved it a hundred times over but not to show him your anger remember that all our neighbors are only waiting for an excuse to revenge themselves for your superiority remember that in eighteen sixteen you had a hand in certain arrests I think that you show neither consideration nor love for me, exclaimed Monsieur de Renal with all the bitterness evoked by such a memory, and I was not made a peer. I am thinking, my dear, resumed Madame de Renal with a smile, that I shall be richer than you are, 
that I have been your companion for twelve years, and that by virtue of those qualifications I am entitled to have a voice in the council, and above all, in today's business. If you prefer Monsieur Julien to me, she added with a touch of temper which was but thinly disguised, I am ready to go and pass a winter with my aunt. These words proved a lucky shot. They possessed a firmness which endeavoured to clothe itself with courtesy it decided monsieur de renal but following the provincial custom he still thought for a long time and went again over all his arguments his wife let him speak there was still a touch of anger in his intonation finally two hours of futile rant exhausted the strength of a man who had been subject during the whole night to a continuous fit of anger he determined on the line of conduct he was going to follow with regard to monsieur valenod julian and even eliza Madame de Renal was on the point once or twice during this great scene of feeling some sympathy for the very real unhappiness of the man who had been so dear to her for twelve years. But true passions are selfish. Besides, she was expecting him every instant to mention the anonymous letter which he had received the day before, and he did not mention it. In order to feel quite safe, Madame de Renal wanted to know the ideas which the letter had succeeding in suggesting to the man on whom her fate depended for, in the provinces the husbands are the masters of public opinion. A husband who complains covers himself with ridicule, an inconvenience which becomes no less dangerous in France with each succeeding year. But if he refuses to provide his wife with money, she falls to the status of a laboring woman at fifteen sous a day, while the virtuous souls have scruples about employing her. An odalisk and a seraglio can love the sultan with all her might. He is all-powerful, and she has no hope of stealing his authority by a series of little subtleties. The master's vengeance is terrible and bloody, but martial and generous. A dagger thrust finishes everything. But it is by stabbing her with public contempt that a nineteenth-century husband kills his wife it is by shutting against her the doors of all the drawing-rooms when madame de renal returned to her room her feeling of danger was vividly awakened she was shocked by the disorder in which she found it the locks of all the pretty little boxes had been broken many planks in the floor had been lifted up he would have no pity on me she said to herself to think of his spoiling this this coloured wood floor which he likes so much he gets red with rage whenever one of his children comes in with wet shoes and now it is spoiled for ever the spectacle of this violence immediately banished the last scruples which she was entertaining with respect to that victory which she had only won too rapidly julian came back with the children a little more before the dinner bell madame de renal said to him very dryly at the dessert when the servant had left the room you have told me about your wish to go and spend a fortnight at verrieres Monsieur de Renal is kind enough to give you a holiday. You can leave as soon as you like, but the children's exercises will be sent to you every day so that they do not waste their time. I shall certainly not allow you more than a week, said Monsieur de Renal in a very bitter tone. Julian thought his visage betrayed the anxiety of a man who was seriously harassed. He has not yet decided what line to take, he said to his love during a moment when they were alone together in the drawing-room. Madame de Renal rapidly recounted to him all she had done since the morning. The details are for tonight, she added with a smile. Feminine perversity, thought Julian. What can be the pleasure, what can be the instinct which induces them to deceive us? I think you are both enlightened and at the same time blinded by your love, he said to her with the same coldness. Your conduct today has been admirable, but it is prudent for us to try to see each other tonight. This house is paved with enemies. Just think of Eliza's passionate hatred for me. That hate is very like the passionate indifference which you no doubt have for me. Even if I were indifferent, I ought to save you from the peril in which I have plunged you. If chance so wills it that Monsieur de Renal will speak to Eliza, she can acquaint him with everything in a single word. What is to prevent him from hiding near my room, fully armed? what not even courage said madame de renal with all the haughtiness of a scion of nobility i will never demean myself to speak about my courage said julian coldly it would be mean to do so let the world judge by the facts but he added taking her hand you have no idea how devoted i am to you and how overjoyed i am of being able to say good-bye to you before this cruel separation End of chapter twenty one